It seems the gears of the great cosmos operate like a grandfather clock of probability, and who out there couldn't use the extra oomph? That is why today we're talking to Austin Kopic, a popular writer, teacher, and reader of the stars based in Los Angeles, a fellow California transplant from a miserable Midwest town, and a real powerhouse in the astrological community, recommended as the go-to guy from our favorite wizard, Gordon White. A true honor and a pleasure. Austin, my man, welcome to the higher side. Well, thanks for having me. That was a hell of an intro, by the way. Thanks, man. Thanks. I am psyched. I, I appreciate you taking the time. I've been digesting a lot of your work this week, which sometimes strains my simple stoner mind, but you definitely know your stuff. And I'm sure you're a bit sick of the so Austin, how'd you get into astrology question? But as a longtime video game addict, having a Final Fantasy game as your entry point is something I got to ask you about. I hear you say astrology kind of wore you down. How did you get from thinking that this was all garbage to making a serious career out of it? Oh, what a long, strange trip it's been. <laughs> so I was raised in the Rust Belt, like yourself. And my, my folks are very reasonable people. There's a lot of academics on my dad's side and kind of grew up with the rationalist, materialist perspective being my, my, I don't know, mental, spiritual womb. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you're coming from that perspective, astrology is not just an absurdity, it's almost an atrocity, right? <laughs> yes. And it's not like what was in the newspaper made a terribly compelling case for itself. And so it wasn't until I went away and was in college and I was double, I double majored in philosophy and psychology. And I was really interested in personality typing systems. I was doing that thing that I don't know, I think it's a developmental stage thing where a person tries to learn more about who they are by comparing and contrasting themselves with other common human types, right? Yeah. And so I was like, you know, looking into Jung and the Myers-Briggs and all that. And astrology kind of kept popping its head up it just as an idea of, you know, a system of 12 human types uh, along with the Zodiac. But I wasn't very interested in it until I played way too much Final Fantasy Tactics. <laughs> <laughs> right on. I, I guess it's a, it's a classic, now classic, tactical turn-based RPG. And the thing where that connects with astrology is that they actually modeled one relatively sophisticated piece of astrology in a technically accurate way in the combat system in the game. All of your little characters, dragons and wizards and knights and all that, everybody has a zodiac sign. And depending upon the interaction between the signs of two of the characters interacting like sword or excuse me knight tries to fight dragon one's a cancer one's a pisces according to the game it would modify the probability of a successful action or an unsuccessful action based on the interaction between the signs and that relationship between the signs is a key piece of astrology we call that aspect doctrine and it's just geometry and the number, the way that the circle is divided. And so I installed this in my brain because I wanted to beat the game on hard. Of course. And what I started seeing was that some of those patterns, well, actually all of those patterns, because they modeled it pretty well, described the interactions of the people I was seeing in my workplace, because I at least knew their sun signs. I knew which tropical sign the sun was in when they were born. And that convinced me to learn just a little bit more. And when I learned a little bit more, I saw that the way that astrology modeled a human being, their life and their psyche, was to take a, a few, not too many core, some of, we could say atomic components, the planets themselves that represented the, the various spheres of a person's life and psyche. And that everyone had the same spheres, but that they were distributed around a circle, the circle of the sky of the zodiac, in a different way. And that the 12 signs were a division of that circle, right? And so what I realized was that it was, a, it had a very finite, small number of components, but because it was using geometry to locate them on basically a circular spectrum and 
describe the interactions, you had millions and millions of different types that were described with a very small number of pieces. And I thought to myself that even though astrology was obviously garbage, <laughs> this was just a genius way to design a human typing system. You know, it's sort of taking it out of the binary and the linear, you know, turning that line into a circle yeah. and assuming that all of these pieces that we all have can interact in thousands of different ways. And so I was like, oh, <laughs> this blows Jung out of the water. <laughs> and so that gave me the license to learn a little bit more. I was like, oh, well, this is just, you know, terribly intellectually sophisticated. And so am I. <laughs> <laughs> of course. And so then I started practicing interpreting people's lives or psyches according to the rules of the art as I understood them at the time. And, you know, it was uh, increasingly creepily accurate, but I wasn't convinced. Like, I, I, I didn't take all of astrology's claims to be validated by the fact that Oh, that was more right than I could have guessed, you know. <laughs> right. Because, you know, we know that sometimes you get lucky and sometimes there are patterns of luck. You know, we have this category, this uh, intuition is sort of this dumping ground for explaining how we did or knew something mm -hmm. <laughs> that, we, mm -hmm. with, that we weren't previously trained in or weren't informed about. And I was like, oh, I guess I'm kind of intuitive. That That must be it. It certainly couldn't be that astrology is fundamentally valid. Right. And it was actually after a few years of that, predicting uh, a few kind of terrible things that happened in people's lives very accurately, mm. um, which is something I would not do unasked now or even within the last 15 years. But there were there were a couple deaths. And I was like, oh, did this person die? You know, did this kind of situation? I don't want to describe it exactly. I feel like that's cheap. But. Basically, I was like, you know, it, did this person die under these conditions in this time frame? And then with the time frame being within the last month, and then it happened two weeks after that. Oh, shit. Yeah. And that freaked me out. You know, it made me take astrology seriously. It also made me take talking to people about astrology more seriously. Mm. And it maybe took a year or two to come to terms with that. That like, oh, this is a real thing. This can describe real events in people's lives. This isn't just an incredibly sophisticated Rorschach test. Right. And so that that made me one take it seriously, and then two want to learn the real rules. You know, I'd, I'd exhausted the kind of hippie used bookstore where <laughs> where I lived at the time. And perhaps you've talked with Gordon about this. When we're dealing with esoterica, there's this layer of post-60s material mm -hmm. that's very difficult to chew through and that tends to obscure much of the older and more interesting and generally more potent material. And so I chewed through that, that sort of post-60s stuff and, you know, kind of went in search of deeper weirder stronger <laughs> <laughs> yeah str stronger vintage older vintage as it were and i just kind of got increasingly into it i also i guess we have two hours i can tell the long version of the story <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> you know and so at that point in my life i just graduated from college and i remember during my last two months in school i was Working on uh, two, uh, uh, I had to do, I did a double major and I had to do two, uh, two senior thesis projects. I remember sitting down and just wanting to write about astrology. I was like, I think I don't care about this anymore, which was a really unfortunate time, <laughs> <laughs> you know, to come across that perspective. Oh, yeah. This is actually in 2001. So there's some interesting things happening in the world at that point, too. <laughs> of course. You know, and so it wasn't just a number of illusions and buildings that kind of fell down in smoking ruin. It was actually my personal ontology or my personal metaphysic was in the process of having the tower card played on it. Wow. You know, you can't just go, oh, I guess astrology is correct, and then go about your business if you're at all 
philosophically minded or seriously minded. Mm -hmm. You know, it has implications about reality, right? Right, <laughs> exactly. That's the, the tip of an iceberg. Mm -hmm. That's the thing for me is I've recognized that it has some accuracy. But the big question for me, and even I guess astrologers don't agree from what I understand, is how this system works or why it works. I mean, what are your thoughts? How can the movement of celestial bodies through their established patterns have any effect on the thoughts and feelings and experiences of people on little old Earth? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And people have been arguing about it for a very, very, very long time. One of the issues is we don't have we don't have a statement by the guy or gal who invented astrology and said, OK, here's how this works. Here's how you do it. This is why it works. Now have fun. Although there are precedents to systematize astrology that go back as far as the human experience and as far as our archaeology goes, this type of uh, what we call horoscopic astrology, which depends upon rather precise mathematics and rules of interactions between the planets and all that, dates to the first century-ish BC. We have our first charts in the Eastern Mediterranean from that period, sort of, you know, early Roman Empire, waning Greek Hellenistic power. And our earliest texts all refer back to texts that are two or three generations previous. Uh, the art of astrology is actually attributed in these oldest texts, and you'll like this, to one, Hermes, hmm. right? So we have a divine origin. Oh, Hermes taught us, right? And that's, <laughs> that's something you get with all the, you have the, and so you have the trouble of received knowledge rather than invented knowledge. Mm -hmm. Another alternate sort of mythic founder are these, or founders, is the pro wrestling tag team of Nechepso and Petasiris. <laughs> who were an Egyptian pharaoh and his priest that he worked with. Now, we're not actually sure these guys existed. Historians have had a really hard time locating who they might actually be, but it's that uh, if we take them just sort of as standing in for an idea, right? You have the ruler and the astrologer, and that's certainly a pairing that has occurred many, 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 many times throughout history. John Dee and Elizabeth being one really obvious one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so anyway, oh, and then you you have another uh, description of the knowledge to a deity, which is Anubis, right? Which is the, the jackal-headed um, god in the Egyptian system who was like Mercury in his psychopomp role or guide of souls into the underworld role. Mm -hmm. So Anyway, we don't have – the Nchepso and Pedasiris don't just lay it down, and Hermes is, doesn't give us an explanation that satisfies the intellectual conditions of the early 21st century. <laughs> now, there are a couple different ways to look at it, and I think that part of the reason that this question is difficult is that the answer has to be layered there's not one simple mechanism which explains everything. So the first layer of uh, why astrology works is material. The extent of astrology absolutely can't be explained by material factors only, but we shouldn't get rid of the ones that do matter. Does the sun affect us? Yes, we're being blasted by it mm -hmm. <laughs> absolutely every day. You know, and then we have the moon and the tides. Right. Right. We can say that the sun and the moon have a tremendous effect on life on Earth. And in fact, life on Earth wouldn't exist without them, right? Mm -hmm. But that's a, that, that goes nowhere to explaining why Neptune, who's so distant from us, might have anything to do with how my day went. Exactly. Right? <laughs> right? But we should say, yes, the sun is doing something, right? Mm -hmm. It's just not doing everything. There's another set of explanations which you see described in Hindu terms and in Kabbalistic terms and in Platonic terms, which is that the, the planets represent a sort of, uh, they represent a higher metaphysical order and reflect what's going on in a higher metaphysically, right, ontologically higher, more causative level. And then in a sense, they're, they're symptoms of something greater. 
And that's something you actually see in both astrology and proto-astrology as the, the planets as giving signs as to the will of the gods, mm -hmm. not being the gods themselves. That explicit identification is actually pretty rare. In the Greek texts, for example, they don't look up at, at Jupiter and say, that's Zeus. Mm -hmm. They say, that's Zeus's planet, right? And it, its movements and qualities reflect his nature. Gotcha. And so you have the planet sort of testifying to a powerful but concealed causative factor. And then there's the sort of 20th century grab bag, sort of the, the 20th century system error category, which is synchronicity, right? Because synchronicity is just saying that those patterns are there and meaningful. And even though they're random, they mean something. But it, it's synchronicity is in, in many senses defined by a lack of explanation or a lack of mechanism, right? It doesn't mean that we don't need that category, but it it doesn't do us tremendous service in explaining things. It just it's a way of recognizing that there's a pattern that's meaningful that we basically we don't have an explanation for. And so what I've been thinking a lot recently, and this is in part inspired by some of my conversations with Gordon, and this this ties into some other stuff, is the is the the animist explanation. Right. And so what's funny that I'm coming to this now, I'm in my late 30s now, but I remember having an argument with a friend of mine in college when I was 19 about astrology, and I thought it was stupid. And he was like, so do you think that the earth might be uh, alive as a whole in some way? And I was like, yeah, okay. Gaia hypothesis. Yeah, I'm, you know, I think that's not unreasonable. Mm -hmm. He's like, and so you don't think any of the other planets are alive. You just think Earth is alive. And I was like, well, that is kind of a logical <laughs> extension. And so basically, if human beings are not the only matter which hosts mind, but if there are, in a sense, much larger organisms, and I'm using that loosely, such as planets and stars, and they have a means of perception and will, then what we have are basically vast currents of mind which are hitting the earth from all these directions. Mm. And then so people, you know, it's like, well, why would the planets pay attention to us? What else is there to watch in this solar system? Like, where, where are there other, like, frantic monkeys doing hilarious things all the time? Right. Right. It's pretty barren out there. Yeah. And to take it further, and again, I'm going to bring Gordon into this. He was our matchmaker. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, why, why would a star, you know, a billion light years away care about what's happening on Earth? Because astrology certainly involves the planets. I would say it primarily involves the members of our solar system, which I sometimes think of the planets are almost like the organs of the body of our solar system. Mm. That's actually something which is taken seriously in the astrology of anatomy, that there's this, uh, this correspondence. And so maybe we can make a good argument for that. But what about, you know, why would, let's say the foot of Orion, Rigel, why would, uh, <laughs> why would Rigel care? And so, one, I think we can assume that the attention span of a being made of plasma that lived for billions of years is slightly wider than our own. But I would also make the argument that we're probably not the only show in town, but, you know, as we as we look for evidence of uh, sophisticated, intelligent life on our scale, not on a stellar scale uh, in the universe, we see that it's probably pretty rare. And so, you know, even if there are 15 different civilizations that Rigel can see or is aware of, we're probably still really interesting hmm. on a, you know, cosmic scale, what's happening here. And I don't mean that that doesn't necessarily mean that we're great. Yeah. It just <laughs> means that this is, this is where the show is. And so, at least lately in my thinking, I'm, I've gravitated strongly towards a, an animist foundation for astrology. And I think there's actually a lot of earlier thinking that implies that. 
and there are some threads of the Platonic explanation for astrology uh, or neo uh, Neoplatonist models, where they they say, yeah, so the planets are alive; they're creatures. And there's actually this sort of underlayer of animist language in our earliest astrological texts. Mm -hmm. Then they get they get philosophized and rationalized, where it's sort of uh, it has the the cleanliness of mathematics, but also some of the sterility. You know, and so part of the way you have to treat astrology, as well as a number of other things, esoteric things, is that we're basically a cargo cult. You know, we're finding books that tell us how to do stuff. You know, here's how you build this machine. And so you could, you know, you could give someone instructions for how to build a functional radio without them understanding any of the principles involved in its operation. And so that's just sort of the position we're in. And maybe, you know, again, when you look at the oldest, uh, the oldest text, where it's, they, you know, the position it has received knowledge from Hermes thrice great, perhaps it's always been that way. And that's part of the, the difficulty when, of getting a, a technological upgrade from a spirit source, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> when, when the watchers come down and show you how to forge iron and, and create makeup, right? <laughs> you, they, you don't necessarily understand how, you just do it. Fair enough. Man, that's a, a great explanation. I think it does help to clarify quite a bit, even though it is still a mystery at heart, even for people like you who do it all the time. But when it comes to magic and astrology, I am interested largely because the people in the past and secret societies and many branches of the elite have put value in it. And now I don't think it's a coincidence that it's pretty absent from the larger monoculture. But what can you tell us about the history of astrology and its use by the various upper echelons? It's an interesting question because <laughs> immediately what I start thinking about is how astrology at various points, this being one of them, has been very countercultural. Or when you look at some of the secret societies of the recent European past, it was basically the, the height of aristocratic counterculture. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was bad. It was forbidden. But then you also have, again, like one of our oldest models in the oldest text is like, yeah, a priest and a king yes. are the model for the astrologer. And so some of the probably the earliest instances we have of astrology that's relatively well recorded is Mesopotamian. And in some of the earliest sheets, uh, lists of omen lore, right, when Mars rises as, as the sun sets and as it is maximum brightness, it means this for the king. That earliest layer of astrology is what's going to happen to the king or what's going to happen to the kingdom that the king might be able to do something about. Mm -hmm. And so you have, it's literally the oldest layers that we have record of are for whoever was most elite in that society. And so there is a very old tradition of that. You know, it was also said that Augustus, uh, Caesar Augustus, was identified by an astrologer before he came to power as being a ruler of, of such power that the, the Romans had never seen before. Wow. The story, <laughs> the story, there are actually a couple of good Roman stories. <laughs> um, the story was that Octavius would be later a dubbed Augustus, right? Augustus means you're awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Octavius was his name. That uh, uh, Augustus and his friend Agrippa went to see this astrologer. And Agrippa goes in, sees the astrologer, they sit and talk, and Agrippa comes out, and Octavius says, All right, well, what did he say? He says, Well, I'm going to have a ton of power. I'm going to be a really successful general. It's, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> and then Augustus goes in, and the astrologer just kneels to him, kneels before him instantly. And says, you know, you'll have such power as the Romans have never seen. Damn. <laughs> and so that's that's apocryphal. That's not up on YouTube. We don't have video evidence <laughs> of that. But then the Roman emperors and their astrologers have a close but often conflicted relationship. The Roman emperors were pretty big on abusing their astrologers, at least the bad ones were. And also testing them in very interesting ways. 
I, I believe it was Tiberius, the first thing that he would ask an astrologer when he was interviewing for the position, because of course you have that position, <laughs> was, uh, so how long are you going to live? And if the astrologer said, I'm in great danger right now, um, <laughs> generally they got to the next round of the interview. Right. There's another good story. I think, gosh, I think this is Tiberius. I haven't looked at this in a little bit where an astrologer comes in and uh, the guy, and the question is instead, how are you going to die? And the astrologer says, uh, I will be torn apart by wild dogs. And by the way, if you look at some of the earlier interpretive models, like that's, that's a literal thing you see in Greco Roman astrology, because mm -hmm. that's, that's the thing that happens. Yeah. You know, you're out traveling and you're alone after dark and there's a pack of dogs <laughs> and you don't necessarily win. No. But anyway, it's just, you know, I'll tr be torn apart by, by wild dogs. And the emperor says, no, you won't. And has him executed right then. And then they prepare a pyre to burn the body. But there, there's a wind that comes on uh, and blows the body off the pyre. And just then a pack of dogs gets into the courtyard and just savages the body. Oh, oh man. You know, dogs will grab a grab a piece, pull, and then run off with their prize, yeah. right? So, again, you have, and this as an astrologer, you have this really troubled, complicated relationship to power because you're useful to power, right? Mm -hmm. And they kind of want you, but they kind of want to abuse you. <laughs> <laughs> I get that. And so, you know, a lot of uh, astrologers, uh, you know, I think there is many sort of opinions or relationships to power as there are astrologers. But, yeah, you can, you know, you can just go through the, the history of empire and even of much smaller kingdoms. And, you know, there's almost always a diviner and anywhere that the horrifyingly sophisticated and precise version of astrology spread, you have rulers cherishing and abusing astrologers mm. you know other really obvious key points or you know good instances are you know john d and queen elizabeth right <laughs> that's I, I'm, I i imagine that's familiar to a lot of your listeners right um you know john d was her astrologer way before she was queen he actually got in trouble for looking at her i guess it was her half sister's chart Mary Queen of Scots and saying like, you know, listen, Elizabeth, she's not going to be in power very long. You bide your time. You know, her time's going to be up in 16 months. He was discovered for doing that and imprisoned. He was right, hmm. by the way. But, you know, there's again, there's a long and complicated relationship. I think what this uh, I guess the other part of this that you spoke to earlier is the fact that even even in these societies where. For example, uh, Elizabethan England, where the, you know, the monarch thought it was very useful to consult an astrologer, even if you weren't always nice to him or her. It wasn't generally acceptable for the pop, the populace to do so, right? Mm -hmm. Some of this is the, the people's fault because people don't like the, and this is a human thing. Uh, I'm one of the people too. <laughs> People don't like to be told that they have less choices than they wish they did. Right. Right. To a certain degree, astrology implies a conspiracy of fate and fortune. This is not to say that astrology, uh, that practicing or thinking about astrology necessitates an entirely deterministic worldview, but it does suggest that there's a structure, there's a deep structure to life. Um, which you can't see and which is composed of more than just material elements, right? That there, there is such a thing as, as fate, or at least some things in life are fated. Mm -hmm. And perhaps not everyone is equally fated. That would actually be my experience. <laughs> and so that's unsettling. You know, the, the, when the fates are described mythologically, they're very rarely, if ever, friendly inviting and reassuring figures yeah. right yeah. <laughs> so you know and so there, there's a human tendency to be like no nah, i'd rather that not be true however to be fair with the acknowledgement of fate also comes the acknowledgement of destiny right the, that one perhaps one is born with purpose true right that's a positive aspect 
Well, yeah, and you can't have one without the other, mm -hmm. right? There's either a deep structure to human life and there's a there are elements of a narrative built into it on a level most people can't see, and that's fate and that's destiny, or there aren't, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the aren't version is the you know, the is French ex is, you know, is mid 20th century existentialism. Oh, I could do anything, but nothing has meaning. <laughs> Les Sock. Yeah. So, but anyway, yeah, you have this kind of weird relationship between the populace and astrology. And in some cases, such as in Nazi Germany, they do this thing where the upper echelons have astrology and then it's banned. It's literally just banned for everyone else. Exactly. And so, you know, there's the question now, why is astrology held in such low regard? To what degree is that a result of intentional engineering on the part of cultural forces that are coordinated on purpose? And to what degree is it just, you know, where the zeitgeist is relative to astrology? Right. I'm sure it's a little of both, but it's always, you know, like you said earlier, been a counterculture kind of thing. But you can't disregard that element that the elite have sort of quarantined it. Yeah, well, and the thing is, so um, when you look at the history of astrology, it's like a sine wave with the, you know, whatever the mainstream culture of whatever mainstream culture is. Astrology is the sine wave that kind of intersects with it and goes below and goes high, you know, up and down and up yeah. and down. And, you know, where we've been since the say since the 60s is it's been kind of this cool countercultural thing or maybe not cool <laughs> but it's been it's been part of the spiritual counterculture in the the anglophone west and so it's starting to get popular again a little bit by bit and a lot of astrologers i know are just you know they're over the moon about it and they're like oh we can help the world if everybody knew about this we you know we'd have a deeper and more aware population. But when you look at what happens when astrology becomes relatively accepted and popular is it becomes a tool for propaganda mm. and you, and you, you get stuck in that position where you're answering the emperor's question of when you're going to die. Mm. And so as soon as power recognizes astrology, then everybody who's playing that game wants their pedicerus. They want their, <laughs> their diviner, at their side right. because everybody else has one and that's not necessarily good for astrology it might be useful for those in power i mean i assume some of your listeners probably most of them most people are aware that ronald reagan had an astrologer i'd heard that i was that was on my list of things to ask you about in terms of any post-world war ii involvement because it's pretty sparse you don't hear too much yeah but i did hear that yeah there's a particular chain, uh, there's a pattern to the chain of American presidential assassinations that Ronald Reagan actually breaks. You know, there's an attempted assassination mm. against him. And this is where, I don't know, I think it gets interesting with astrology, because if you understand the structure of what wants to happen to a person during a given period, it clarifies what choice, if it can be avoided at all, you know, you can get that five or 10% chance <laughs> rather than just rolling the dice. And so a number of people have speculated that it was actually due to having astrologer that he was able to kind of opt out of a particular pattern. I mean, he did get shot. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> but I love that. Yeah. <laughs> when that's part of how astrology works, you know, there are very few things that are 100%. You got nothing. There's nothing you can do. But if you know that, you know, during a given month or year, that there will be problems to attend to in a particular area, and they will tend to arrive within a, a pretty specific window, a lot of times you can prepare or you can minimize difficulties in that area. Also, you know, uh, on the positive side, if you know that there's a particularly good window of time you know you can maximize the way you take advantage of that mm -hmm. right and also stop pushing your luck once the good period ends right and uh, i and a number of astrologers have, have done that quite literally with with gambling <laughs> um <laughs> you know like okay i've got this window you know it's the moon is conjoining jupiter it's the hour of jupiter i'm going to play roulette for just that hour and then stop 
That's kind of funny. Like I w recently, I had heard some uh, random old Vincent Price audio recordings, and uh, he talked about astrology and a lot of esoteric stuff. But he told a little anecdote that Hitler used to use his astrologer to find the right windows to make his campaigns, his attacks. And eventually Churchill got wind that he was using an astrologer. So he got his own astrologer just to learn the game plan, just to kind of get insight into when Hitler's windows would be and thus kind of negating the usefulness of Hitler's astrology, which kind of gets to that point of if you have it, you really don't want a whole lot of other people to have it because if everybody's kind of reading the same stuff, it affects the way everybody's going to act around, you know, these particular events. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's a really great example of that, uh, and that's the English Civil War. My my friend and colleague Alexander Cummins, Dr. Al, as it were, who's been on uh, Gordon's show, wrote a book a couple years ago called The Starry Rubric. Hmm. And it's basically his study of the way that astrology was mobilized during the English Civil War. And basically both sides recruit astrologers to write publicly that, you know, the heavens ordain that their side is correct. And so astrologers, and this happened in World War II as well, astro when astrology is embraced by power, it becomes part of the propaganda apparatus. Right, right. And that's part of why I'm a little like, let's not get too popular. I don't want to get burned. When we're embraced too much, we become tools. Mm -hmm. And so it's problematic. And that's a really fun book, by the way, the starry rubric, because you see these incendiary rants and you see people who are otherwise excellent astrologers with a great track record of prediction being pushed by um, political necessity to, you know, to write things that are not what the heavens declare they're what their patron declares mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's cool yeah i'll definitely check that out another thing kind of in this vein that i had planned to ask you about was the astrological conditions of 9-11 or of ground zero during the events of 9-11 i'm not sure exactly the best way to read it but i know that you have looked at it we were talking about it a little bit before tell us about what you found there and the usefulness of astrology in a situation like that yeah, so I'm going to try to spare you and your listeners as much technical language as possible, but I can't get around all of it, so bear with me. Sure. So 9-11 was signified very – oh, by the way, an astrologer, Robert Zoller, predicted 9-11 in writing several times about a year, year and a half before it happened. Wow. He said, unprecedented terrorist attack, northeastern United States, 9-11, <laughs> And of course, he got a bunch of dudes in sunglasses and suits showing up at his house <laughs> shortly after it happened. Of course. Now, although if you look at a chart, you'll generally see a dizzying number of data points Usually what actually triggers or signifies a particular event, either for all of us, you know, for the macrocosm or for an individual, is usually one, just one or two factors, right? We've got to sort these things out and prioritize them. And so the main thing that was happening during 9-11 was this opposition of Saturn and Pluto relative to the Earth. And so when, when planets are opposed from our point of view, it means when one would rise in the east, the other would set in the west, right? Mm -hmm. Now, Saturn and Pluto's cycle is actually one of the few cycles that's not regular in length because Pluto has a really elliptical orbit. And so what that means is from our perspective, when Pluto is in one part of his cycle, he will take nine years to cover 30 degrees of the zodiac or that wedge of sky. And at another part of his cycle, he'll take almost 30 years to do exactly the same 30 degrees. Everybody else basically moves in a circle. You know, every 12 years, Jupiter's going to be in the same position. Every 29 and a half, Saturn's going to be in another position. But when you look at any planet relative to Pluto, you get this cycle that expands and contracts. And so this Saturn-Pluto cycle, right? And we can see that this is a lot like the, this is a synodic cycle. And so a synodic cycle is 
any two planets cycle relative to each other. And so everybody's familiar with one synodic cycle, and it's the one between the sun and moon relative to the earth. That's what creates the fullness and emptiness of the moon. That's why the moon waxes and wanes. We can see that writ really large. But every other, you can take any other pair of planets and they'll, they'll basically have their own waxing, full moon, waning, new moon phase. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It does. Okay. So, and each, uh, each of these pairs has a topic. It has types of things. It's basically, you figure out, okay, you know, uh, you figure out the length of the cycle and its rhythm, and then you figure out what moves with it. And it's power. Power moves with the Saturn-Pluto cycle. And so whenever we're looking at a cycle like that, you know, if we're just starting out with what's most interesting, like what are going to be the most dramatic points, we want basically the full moon is the most dramatic, right? And then the new moon, when the moon entirely disappears from the sky, is the other dramatic point. Okay. Right? And so if we look at these two, and Saturn-Pluto being power, power like not in a philosophical sense, but in like a down and dirty political, <laughs> political, military, industrial complex sense. Right. That Saturn-Pluto opposition was basically the full moon part of that cycle. This time it was a 38-year cycle. And 9-11 happened within about three weeks of the perfect full moon in a cycle that long. Wow. Yeah. And so what's additionally interesting, you know, you take a cycle like this, right? So that this just, if we reduced a chart down to this, it would just look like Saturn on one side, Pluto exactly opposite, right? Mm -hmm. Now, then what we do is we take the chart of, of an entity like myself or yourself or the United States. And then we say, how does it hit this entity's chart, right? Your individual chart is sort of, it's the way that you receive whatever's happening in the sky, right? And what's interesting is that the most commonly used chart for the United States, it's called the, the Sibley chart after the English astrologer who published it. It's basically the signing of the Declaration of Independence, that being when the United States entity comes into being. Okay, right? makes sense. It's harder, you know, it, and it's nice that we actually have a document. It's harder to do that. So if, you know, if you're looking at, let's say, modern day Iran, right, that's where the Persian Empire was. That's where lots of, there wasn't, it didn't just come into being, right? The United States is a little easier to time and to get a chart, right? So probably the one of the most important things in any chart is where the horizon falls. You ever heard people talk about their rising sign? Absolutely. Right? So it's literally what sign is rising on the eastern horizon, right? Where the sun rises, where everything rises. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we have opposite to that, we have the setting point, right? And so that's represented in a chart as a horizontal line that hits, you know, a single degree on one side and a single degree on the other side. So those are really sensitive points. You know, it's the, it, if you just think about the symbolism of where things emerge into being, right, where it's where the sun rises and sets every day, it's huge. Yeah, yeah. Symbolism of that predates, like, technical astrology by God knows how many thousand years. Oh, yeah. But astrology incorporates that. And so that's really sensitive. If, for example, we were looking at Saturn moving through the chart, and it hit the degree of your rising, Greg, you would be like, oh, I remember that. That was some shit. <laughs> so anyway, so we said, these, so these are really sensitive points, and they're always opposed because the eastern and western horizon are really always opposed, yeah. right? So the sad, this Saturn-Pluto opposition was bang on the United States rising and setting points. And so we have, you know, it's this full moon of power moves, and it's just right there on the U.S. chart. Wow. Right. So, it, I mean, we're, you know, we would we could say generally we're like, oh, that's going to be huge. There's going to be something which really shakes up the power dynamics. And we'd have to use a lot of other techniques to figure out what it was. But to a certain degree, it's not so much what it was, but what it did. Right. What what the world's reaction to it was. Mm -hmm. So. Taking this cycle, I want to go back to these full and new moon points, just so you and your listeners can see that it's it's not just this one thing that happened once, right? 
this this conjunction this conjunction or opposition this pairing of planets speaks to power right okay so the new moon of which that was the full moon happened in basically 19 uh, 1981 1980 81 right we have the beginning of the reagan era for the united states in, in which a lot of precedents are set and if we look at you know is that important as far as the history of power in the 20th century goes absolutely yeah. and then if we go back to the new moon before that we have the late 40s and uh, it's when well it's when a lot of things happen it's the the aftermath of world war 2 where you know god probably 30 countries are created and so there are all these countries especially in the middle east that have that Saturn and Pluto new moon, that Saturn and Pluto conjunction in their natal chart, right? They're, they're created out of these power moves, these like dragging knives and, and pens across a map. <laughs> wow. Anyway, and this is how we, you know, this is part of how astrologers cut up history. Yeah. And this is a particular, uh, this particular pairing is really useful for looking at scary power moves. And these moves all have big consequences. So when's the next one happening, right? <laughs> so if we had our full moon, uh, our full moon in 2001, right? Then our next new moon and the new, so uh, just to use that analogy and to explain this cycle, when the planets are opposed from our point of view, that's like a full moon and it, it's really big. You know, that's, that's where big moves happen. Okay. The new moon part, which is like 81, like 48, those are when, that's sort of the seed part of the cycle rather than the flowering of the cycle. Okay. It's when a, you know, it's when a new order is designed and implemented, but it, it's more seeds being planted. Whereas the full moon or 2001 is more like the, uh, the, the <laughs> that seed bearing fruit as it were. Gotcha. And so our new moon or seed point is 2020. And so we're, we're coming up on that. And, you know, because, you know, if you look at the world right now, and if you imagine yourself as being possessed of great and terrible power, there are a lot of things that are out of control. Some of them, maybe you helped set in motion. Some of them maybe had consequences that uh, or went in a direction you were too happy about. But that's sort of the new plan stage. Right on. And so we're in, in a sense, we're in the we're in the very end of a cycle of power that began in 81 and that bore fruit in 2001 and we're just at the very last stages <laughs> of that wow so basically hillary or trump's only going to get one term <laughs> uh absolutely <laughs> and so yeah and there are uh, yeah yeah there are a number of politicians who have that Saturn conjunct Pluto, that that new moon part of the power cycle, really? unsurprisingly, in their charts. Have you been able to get much insight into the current election based on this? I mean, saying it ends in 2020, that's really interesting. And considering like blocks of you know power dynamics, it would make sense for Hillary to win for the next four years and then be the capstone on this big sliver of, of a power center that's had control for quite some time. Yeah, I believe that that is what will happen. Wow. There was actually, uh, it was, we were talking before you started recording, I just got back from a conference, and there was a presidential panel on the conference, nice. which um, has been done at conferences before. I was a little unhappy about this one because I was like, dude, I, you know, and I, I said on a different podcast several months ago, I was like, it's going to be really obvious that Hillary's going to win. It's not a good demonstration of astrology. It's a coin flip where the Vegas odds are 85% in one person's favor. Yeah. This is not how we show the validity of our art, <laughs> right? Although I did, I, I feel like I scored points with my meta prediction. <laughs> right on. But, uh, but anyway, what came up was really interesting, and that's, so the, the conference organizers courted a lot of press around this presidential panel. And so usually, you know, astrologers have this sort of luxury of talking shop with each other, even at big conferences, right? Where it's sort of, you know, it's not preaching to the choir, but it's... Uh, People who know. Yeah, it's talking with a level of intimacy and familiarity. Yeah. And so 
but with, with this particular instance, because there was more press, we got a lot of scrutiny and it, it brought up, I think, for a lot of astrologers for the first time, what it means to do astrology when power cares <laughs> and when the mainstream culture cares what you're doing. And so it, you know, it, it brings up that whole set of conundrums that we talked about earlier. Yeah. Right. And so one of my go-to ancient sources is the, is a book of astrology called the math thesis, which is written by a Roman lawyer named Firmicus Maternus. And he wrote it at the behest of whatever the, the prefect of his province is, this guy named Mavordius. And so it begins, my dear Mavordius. And he, because Mavordius has asked him to explain how astrology works. And so Firmicus is going on and on. There's a lot of technical material, obviously. But then he gets to this one section. He's like, so the astrology of the emperor. He says, basically, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't talk about the emperor. Don't talk about power. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, don't do it. Don't. And then he's like, oh, because... The emperor is divine, wink, wink, and beyond the, uh, you know, beyond the bounds of fate, wink, wink, don't talk mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. And so what's, what I like about Firmicus is that he was a Roman lawyer. He had a position to preserve. You know, he wasn't a street soothsayer. And so, you know, you can see that political pressure on what he's saying about astrology, even in what was not a widely circulated text. And so, you know, there, there's again, there's this issue is how do we how do we relate to power when power starts caring? Yeah, <laughs> because I, I wouldn't say that, you know, astrologers have been the secret collaborators with the despots of history. They have sometimes, but I would say it's rather power is much more attracted to astrology than vice versa. The astrologers have a, a very ambivalent relationship historically to being paired with material power. That makes sense. And there is a quote that I've heard from Gordon when it comes to astrology and power in that millionaires don't believe in astrology, billionaires do, which I really like because it speaks to one level being pretty oblivious to it. But on a higher level, maybe the real capstone cabal behind the curtain, maybe they've preserved the tradition a little better and kept it close to the chest. Yeah, well, and that's actually a J.P. Morgan quote. Oh, well, shit. Which I think speaks to the, the point. Yeah, exactly. The <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like, you know, you don't have to believe it. That's fine. I'm not interested in, you know, it, it actually benefits me that you don't, mm -hmm. right? Because when, you know, it, it's like a technology. There's a parallel to that World War II situation where, you know, if both Hitler and Churchill have astrologers, then, then they're just even. Mm -hmm. But if only one has an astrologer, then they have an edge. Right. Yeah. Oh, you know, while we're talking about astrologers and power, I just remembered another one of my favorite anecdotes. Let's do it. So this is from the Italian Renaissance. And so but the Italian, you know, anything fun and artsy and sciencey worked through patronage during this era. And so astrologers worked through patronage. And so there was a situation where there was one sort of merchant lord who had a number of astrologers and the astrologers just hated him. And, you know, he'd abused them repeatedly, et cetera, et cetera. And so eventually they saw an opportunity where he was going to take a, his family forces into battle uh, against a contending faction. And so the, the astrology of warfare is a thing, right, where you pick the right time for a battle so that your side will win. And so the astrologers picked a time that would be as disastrous as possible, and they got their hated lord killed. <laughs> <laughs> right on. They're like, oh, yes, most most auspicious. <laughs> Definitely go for it. And make sure you hit the exact minute, right? <laughs> sound the, be very careful. Watch the clock and sound the, sound the horn. I love it. Austin, hell of a time. You definitely know your craft well. Big thanks to Gordon for getting us together and for you for being here. Before we go, would you remind the uh, people about your website and classes and how to better align, pun intended, with what you're doing? Sure. So my website is myname.com. It's Austin Kopic. And so that's A-U-S-T-I-N-C-O-P-P-O-C-K.com. I believe I just found out that I'm banned in Canada for being an occult site. That's kind of fun. Badge of honor. <laughs> I want to get banned from somewhere. I'm still working on it, though. Yeah. I, when I learned that, uh, my Can a Canadian friend of mine immediately high-fived me. <laughs> uh, but that's my website. So I write 
I write a weekly column where I attempt to describe what the patterns are this week and how you might relate to them better. I wrote a book, 36 Faces, and I teach classes primarily online. And I have a, a yearly, uh, sort of a year-long learn astrology program that's cut up into month-long units. And although some people do a whole year with me, I also allow people to enroll on a modular level because it's a, it's, astrology is hard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so learning a chunk at a time when you have time is the way that most people do it. And so people can just, you know, go in for let's do the signs, you know, and that's a month or let's do the planets and that's a month. Um, and then I teach a variety of other sort of odds and ends. I taught a planetary magic class. And I do have the recordings of some of my classes edited and available for purchase. Mm. And I do talks sometimes. I haven't been talking too much publicly lately other than on podcasts. But, you know, there are some – there are local astrology groups in a lot of pretty much any major or minor city in the United States. And so sometimes I travel and won't give a talk. Hmm. Right on, man. Yeah, you're doing quite a bit. And you're right. It is hard. It's a really difficult language to learn. I mean, there's a lot of depth there. And every time I do an astrology show, I try to do a couple a year, talk to an astrologer. I get really jazzed up about it. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to I'm going to learn this shit. I'm going to start mapping my life like this. And then as soon as I'm on my own and I have to, like, get into the you know deep waters, I, it's rough. I give up. Well uh, just one thing about learning astrology for you and for any of your listeners who are interested, you've really got to take it one piece at a time. And the pieces are really not that hard or not that complicated by themselves. It's the putting them together that's crazy. But just start with learning what the planets mean in astrology. Cool. Once you're solid on the planets, move on to the signs, right? And it's one piece at a time. And so... You know, for example, let's say, uh, so if we just know what the planets mean, right, that's like depending on what you call a planet and what's not a planet, let's say that's 10 different terms or symbols, right? You can learn 10 things. That's true. And, and then signs. Well, that's only 12 things, right? But then your next step is you have to understand every planet and every sign. So now the next step, you've got 120 things, mm -hmm. right? You've got 10 times 12. And that's why it gets crazy. When you're learning, if you try to jump into the 120 before you have 10 and you have 12. And so, you know, and if you haven't, if you don't have those fundamental terms clear, then you can't multiply them. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you just just, you know, just learn the planets, just learn the signs and then move on to the next step. Right. That seems like a pretty good approach until, of course, we all ship off to the Mars colony and then we have to learn all this stuff from a different perspective. I'm so interested to see what that's going to be like <laughs> astrological level because then you know people are going to have earth in their chart. yeah yeah <laughs> man that's going to be that's going to be trippy i wonder what kind of influence earth will have on a mars chart yeah i i think it'll probably be calming and grounding it's a pretty mellow planet as far as they go you yeah. know when you compare what's going on on earth with the the composition and and weather anywhere else. We live in, you know, Mildville. Yeah, that's true. All right, oh man, well, I could do it all day. You know, the rabbit hole goes deep, but thanks again for being here. I really did love it, and take care of yourself out there. Yeah, you too. This was really fun. Take her easy, Greg. All right, peace, man. Bye. Sweet Christmas, friends. Austin Kopic for the win. I love it. The man knows his craft. It's funny because I've had my chart read twice on the air before. Both times I found it very accurate. I've dug in even deeper, seen more detailed information. I'm a believer for sure. It's kind of hard for me to say that about things I don't really understand the mechanisms behind, but it still works. I guess you don't really need to know the details of what makes your smartphone work or your car drive to use it and see it as a useful tool, right? And of course, there will be naysayers that throw out the same old criticism that, well, it's just a bunch of vague statements that you self-identify with. Yeah, maybe if you only scratch the surface, maybe if you only get your knowledge of astrology from the Huffington Post or the grocery store checkout line. It really annoys me when I hear people citing textbook 
debunking lines as if it's something they came up with themselves, there's always an official answer. The establishment doesn't just say, oh, we don't know about that. There always is a way to discredit it. Roswell was a weather balloon. The Norway spiral was a failed rocket test. And it's funny how quickly some people will look at a mystery and be like, oh my God, what is this? What's going on? And then as soon as that official answer comes out, they're just sharing the links all over the internet and they're positive that that is what it is. Kind of a side note, but those kind of statements get made about astrology too. I think it's bullshit. I think you're um, playing right into their hands if you do that kind of stuff and kind of being a propaganda propagator for the elite. And most of you aren't even getting paid, so. <laughs> but something my main man Gordon brought to my attention just after I recorded this show is this story that NASA changed the Zodiac. And maybe changed isn't the right word because they can't really change anything, but if you Google it, you'll see a bunch of articles. Oh, they did change it. No, they didn't change it. It's just to cause confusion, of course. But they say that they retraced the steps of Babylonia's math and added a new constellation to the Zodiac called Ophiuchus, the snake bearer of all things. And I do remember hearing about Ophiuchus a couple of years ago. I thought then it was just a psychological trick to make astrology seem worthless. And it seems to have been recycled this time from our friends at NASA. You got to give it that official stamp, right? I guess it didn't work the first time. So now you can reinforce the same discreditation with a more established source. But from what I just read five minutes ago, NASA is really just obscuring the difference between constellations and zodiac signs. There is a slight distinction. And here's something from the good folks at astrologyclub.com. Ancient and medieval astrologers considered that there were 48 constellations. Of these, 12 were considered zodiacal constellations. The other 36 were considered extra zodiacal constellations. The 12 zodiacal constellations are those through which the sun appears to pass during the course of a year. And their names, Aries through Pisces, are familiar to anyone interested in his or her sun or star sign. Ophiuchus is one of the 36 extra zodiacal constellations, not one of those which the sun is considered to appear to pass. There also seems to be a hell of a big difference between Western astrology and classic Vedic stuff. So they knew about Ophiuchus, they recognized Ophiuchus, it's just not a zodiac sign. But of course the story is just how dumb the ancients were and how lame astrology is. Just a couple of internet headlines you'll see when you Google the story. NASA changed all the astrological signs and now I'm a crab. Chaos reigns as addition of Ophiuchus cast doubt over accuracy of all horoscopes. Zodiac signs changed by NASA. Has your whole life been a lie? So when you see some esoteric art like astrology being attacked in this way, you can be pretty sure it's worth paying attention to. But what do I know? In the Plus Show this week, if you'd be so kind to sign up, we talked about Saturn quite a bit and the way it's used in the conspiracy world, the idea that the Archons reside out there, what role it might play. We got into the three gifts of Hermes, astrology, magic, and alchemy. Talked about the alchemical resurgence. You know, I'm into that right now. And of course, we talked about how to communicate with entities and strengthen our ability to do so. Remember, you can still get a free week of THC Plus by going to thehiresidechats.com and filling out the form at the bottom of the page. And once you're on the ride, I hope you'll stay. Because in the immortal words of Real Big Fish, we got a good thing going here and I don't want to see it end. And that's it for me. I think I mentioned this last week, but I had a string of cancellations and reschedules. So I still have one more show to get out this month and I'm trying. But it's also the annual holiday celebration of our Dark Lord. And you got to respect that too. But stay tuned. I'll see you then. Your move, Ophiuchus. Your fucking move. Sweet dreams to the elite. We're calling them out on TAC. Uncovering secrets and conspiracies. Everybody's looking for something. Some of them want to use you Some of them want to get used by you Some of them want to abuse you Some of them want to be abused Some of them want
Hey guys, thanks for listening to the first hour of the Higher Side Chats podcast with me, Greg Carlwood. If you don't know, there is a second hour to all the episodes we do around here. Generally, we're able to get a lot deeper into the topics and ideas that a guest is about. So if you enjoyed what you've heard from THC for free, consider signing up at thehiresidechatsplus.com to get the second hour of the five shows I put together each month. I never really wanted to be a paid subscriber podcast, but I really hate the idea of spending airtime promoting some product that's completely unrelated and telling you the best way to support the show is to buy an audiobook or new underwear by mail or something crazy like that. So instead, if you like the show, double your time with it for five bucks a month and let's cut out all the other shit. It's half the price of a movie ticket and you get at least an extra five hours of show a month. Collectively, it keeps us stable, and it frees me from wasting your time with anything but the show you came to listen to. It's really the only way for an independent, one-man show to make it, and I do what I can so that it's worth your while. Since we started this, I've always tried to use the subscriptions to improve the podcast and make signups more advantageous. It started...